Welcome to the Mind Duck Book Podcast. I'm so excited to talk about this book. I had so much fun with this. It might have been the most uh, fun I've had with any book on this podcast so far. This is like the engineer's wet dream. I love this so much. Now, granted, I am very biased. You have to be a giant nerd to like this book. Welcome back to the podcast, guys. Hello. Hello. Hello, Philip. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's back since we are for the first time on the book podcast. Like Martin's back. I'm not. I'm oh, you not. are not. I'm, oh, okay. Well, I'm second time. Yeah. Welcome, first time <laughs> to the podcast. Yeah. Do you feel like you're a giant nerd? Uh, I, I suppose so. Not, not. Uh, uh, yeah, I guess. Yeah, but I'm gonna be like not, not really agreeing with you on this one because my father is definitely not a giant nerd, and he liked this book. Oh, it's nice. not only for nerds. It's a good <laughs> book overall. I, I think it's very accessible. Yeah. I read this. I read this so quickly, and I was having so much fun. I haven't had this much excitement with a book. I don't even remember. And uh, I was feeling like it's because we are both programmers. We are all programmers. And we are all kinds of engineers, and we all like science. And I guess if you don't like those, then you just don't care. But maybe not. I I think the science thing is not necessarily. It's really accessible. The way I think the thing that makes it so easily readable and engaging is exactly that the the sciences are very easy to understand and clearly explained and fairly simple English. So today we are talking about uh, Project Hail Mary by Andy Weir. Uh, the writer who is famous for The Martian, also the movie. And I'm so happy that you're here because I feel like we are the prime time target audience for this type of book. <laughs> oh, definitely we are. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Born too late to explore the Americas and too early to explore the space, you mean? So yeah. you have to li- listen about exploring space. <laughs> yes. Read about it. <laughs> I'm just failing to discover anything in my school, so I just can actually read a book and feel like I'm discovering something through a book. <laughs> so, Martin's a scientist, Adam's a professional programmer, I'm a programmer who forgot how to program, so we're all into this. And uh, I meant to say, you've been listening to my podcast so, and been on the podcast many times, and I wanted to mention that you've both experienced somehow the free body problem. And a good friend of mine mentioned that it's bullshit and they hate the science. And then they said they love this one so much. Who Guess who it is? <laughs> I, I know who it is. I, I'm fairly certain <laughs> I know who it is. Yeah. <laughs> so, Although so it, it, it could be even me because I didn't like the free body problem either. <laughs> it's you. <laughs> oh, it's me. I thought it's different. But... Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was such a fan of someone else, but I guess they didn't read the Free Body Problem. Which did you like better, Martina? Free Body Problem trilogy or this one? Oh, like the the books? I, mm. I didn't read the Free Body Problem. So I, I know them from your podcast. So essentially, I'm quite biased towards your opinion, I think. But I really like the ideas in Free Body Problem. I just didn't like how they were conveyed. Mm. I think I, I really liked... That I was able to just listen to your podcast, get all the ideas from your podcast, and just <laughs> and then be listen done to with me rant about it. And yeah, <laughs> I was I was kind of a target for many long uh, late night rants about uh, uh, how <laughs> fucking shit this book was. But uh, <laughs> yeah, if I were to compare it with Andy Weir's book, like with Hail Mary, uh, definitely Hail Mary. Like this is more of my style of writing so so yeah mm. i definitely would like andy Weir's stuff more it's infinitely easier to read i would say very much so <laughs> <laughs> but i i wanted to say it's so strange how i love both the books but for completely different reasons even though it's in the same category like i really like the free body problem is one of my all-time favorite sci-fi something but i don't want to say story because i don't really like the story i like the ideas like martin said and this might be one of my favorite like stories where you go on a ride and have an adventure and it's like so fun but then there aren't any like grand concept ideas really to think about for hours afterwards i would think did you feel like that yeah it's, it's not exactly high concept uh, but it explores some ideas that uh, don't really get explored much in other sci-fi mm. since it's kind of 
I don't want to say it's like small scale story, but most of the story is kind of small scale and it can really focus <laughs> yeah, on the detail. It's very concise, I would say. It just presents one problem and solves this problem or focuses on solving this one problem for the mm. whole book. And I think the way it's trying to solve the problem and the process of discovering new and new things about the problem mm -hmm. is exactly why I love this book. Just, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's exactly my point. I remember when I was a child, I was uh, I had like an irrational fear of the inability to solve problems. I had like a, like a strange anxiety of having something to do and not knowing how to do it. I'm sure you know this feeling. And then, uh, yeah, but I'm not sure if it was that but then, bad. But then you like go, you become like you get a job, or you, you you like especially if you're somebody who does something technical, you get this like satisfaction from overcoming problems and coming up with solutions. So you have like this itch, you it scratches this itch in your brain. It's like okay, there was a problem and I overcame it and I did it. So it's like problem sol solving porn. This book, it's like a million yeah, yeah. problems, uh, I and can, I you can see have that, constant yeah. satisfaction from solving the problems. You know, and even though they seem like they cannot be solved, you find the solution, and that's somehow super comforting, at least to me. That's how I felt when I read this. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree. You you get a lot of uh, as you, as you said when you finish something, you get endorphins from it, that, and mm -hmm. this book kind of does the same. Yeah. It's like a you know second-hand scientific discovery, uh, the <laughs> book. Uh. <Yeah. laughs> One more thing is that it's also a science lesson, which he said, the writer himself, that he would love to teach science with fiction, which I think he did with this. Yeah, yeah. No, as, as, as I said, it's uh, the science is very the very accessible. Hmm. So I think some things could be learned from it. Yeah, I would think I learned some things I wasn't too clear about. As far as science experiments, or yeah, I don't, know, nice. I don't trying to say things so I don't don't spoil stuff. But <laughs> anyway, well, so we are super positive about this book. But before we get into it, uh, before we get into it deeper, I want to mention the the writer a little bit. And uh, this is the first book I've read from him. I watched the Martian the movie, but I wasn't really compelled to read the book. You have both read the Martian, right? I've first seen the movie. And then a couple of years later, I listened to the book, to the audio, to the audio book. And hmm. I really liked the movie. I really liked the book, but I think the movie is a little bit better, more concise. In a sense, the book, in my opinion, got just a little bit too repetitive with the here is a problem and hmm. here is a solution. And exactly. here's a new problem, and here is a solution. That's basically all of the book, I feel like. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I mean, here is the, it's the same, but a little bit uh, better. There is a very good twist, or a couple of twists on it, that we can't say until the spoilers. <laughs> yeah, the, the, yeah, those twists uh, save it. I think Martian was kind of missing these twists, and since the movie shortened it a bit, uh, that really hmm. helped. I was really surprised how popular the... Martian was. I was like, yeah, I, I think I know what this is. And yes, it's what I thought it was. And how do people like this? Like, I thought people don't like this kind of engineering porn story type. But I don't know. <laughs> like, it's just it's thrilling to see someone discover something new or see someone so excited about knowing new stuff, exploring new stuff. I think mm. that's just beautiful in its own nature. Like hmm. from the movie, I really remember just really cheering on <laughs> Matt Damon the whole way. And uh, I think uh, a lot of it was uh, Andy Weir's sense of humor, hmm. or like because he just has this uh, scientifically exact but also pretty, you know, popular cul culture connected humor. But yeah, I enjoyed Martian. I think I enjoyed Hail Mary more, but Martian was. Uh, amazing as well. Needless to say, I'm really happy that it's popular. I wish all these stories would be the mainstream. And I think it's doing something for, not to sound like a cliche, but future generations of scientists hopefully are being inspired by this. I guess it's the thrill of the discovery. That's the only idea I have, the only answer I have. I, I don't I, I don't think that uh, people inherently dislike science fiction but they generally find it uh, i mean some people generally don't like science fiction but this is presented as for one realistic and 
also very accessible in the way it explains things. So I, f I think that really helps. Hmm. Also, like many people hate science because they hated the way that school taught them science. And oh, okay. This is way other way, like way different kind of way to learn science. And I think this is really fresh for many people. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Which they are already filming the, or planning to film the Project Hail Mary with Ryan Gosling being the main character. Did you hear that? I know it was licensed. I didn't know who's playing the main character, nor that they already started. It might be a rumor, but I read it like yesterday. Can you imagine Ryan Gosling being the character? Uh, I think he could be okay. Yeah, he looks like, a, you know, the, your typical, you know, fresh science teacher. Um, mm. So... I yeah, wish they got yeah. somebody who looked more like Andy Weir, the, the writer. Because his, his smile is kind of ridiculous. Have you seen Andy Weir's awkward smile photos? I don't think so. Oh, I haven't. He looks so awkward. Like, if you if you just type Andy Weir to Google, the first picture that pops up on the right is the, the smile. He's like uh, like rolling his upper lip up inside his mouth or something. It's very weird. And also biting his lower lip. And he's got these huge cheeks, like it's like he's got muscle on top of muscle in his cheeks, and he's looking like straight into the camera. Uh, yeah, those are some big cheeks. <laughs> and in every picture, he's got this smile. I don't know. It's it's cute. Well, I'm not sure about that, but okay, <laughs> glad you say that. <laughs> it's cute. It's all right. It's, it's a nice smile. Sometimes he has his mouth closed, and it's even worse. Oh yeah, yeah. Those I see that they're a bit. Uh, let's say uh, I wouldn't want to meet him at 2 a.m. But uh, <laughs> I, I, th I think it's the eyes, though. The eyes it's also. Not, it's the, not the mouth. It's the eyes on this photo. <laughs> but anyway, he's a programmer. And uh, like I said, I meant to mention a bit about him. He uh, was a software developer and he always had a dream to become a sci-fi writer. So it happened. I'm so happy for him. I'm glad he decided to do that. He received the Campbell Award for the Best New Writer in 2016. Have you ever heard of this? Yep. Never. Campbell Award. I've never heard of this. So basically, he's a good writer. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> and uh, he's into physics, of course, and orbital mechanics and the history of space flight and all this. And I didn't know his father was a physicist and his mother was an electrical engineer, which is like such a technical family. It's... It's insane. Uh, I also found amusing that he worked on uh, the second uh, Warcraft game at the Blizzard. Oh, really? Uh, what did yeah. he do there? Like, I don't what? know. Definitely something technical, not not the design. <laughs> okay. I, fe I feel like it has to be some hard coding. So, of course, uh, his uh, stuff is super, super accurate. And uh, I think this is the antidote to every nitpicker alive. Like, if you love uh, watching movies and then pointing out how, you know, on episode 75 of Star Trek, where tachyons interacted with the gravity well because protons and neutrinos couldn't collide. Uh, <laughs> so this is the book for you. Like, I feel like they, they answer everything. Yeah, it was funny how The Martian was uh, written. So when he wrote The Martian, it uh, was a book he wanted to specifically write as accurately as possible. So he studied and researched all the science and uh, he, I think he accomplished that. And he wasn't very confident about the book itself. So he just gave it away for free. He just published it online. Uh, and people complained about it because it was too inconvenient to download, I guess. So they pushed him to sell it for like a Kindle version. So he was like, okay, okay, just stop complaining about this nonsense. I'm gonna publish it for Kindle so you can just conveniently download it in your Kindle Hilarious. for 99 cents. <laughs> I mean, I, I wouldn't complain <laughs> so about that. So inconvenient, yeah. I have to download this for free from somewhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so then obviously it exploded in popularity and people were like, oh my God, this book is so much fun. Why don't you like sell it like a normal person? <laughs> and at the same time, a publisher found him, so of course uh, they released it like a normal book and then the movie happened and all that so it was super popular so i'm really happy he's so successful it's like a dream come true because he didn't study any writing i don't think he just really loves science and he just wants to you know have the joy of scientific exploration and discovery and problem solving 
So there are other things he wrote. The second book he wrote was Artemis. Do you know anything about that? I, I know that he that he started writing Hail Mary and got into a slump. And so he hmm. wrote Artemis like um, uh, to take a break from Hail Mary. Hmm. And, uh, and that it supposedly sucks. But that's <laughs> all I know about it. My dad, again, read it. Mm-hmm. And he himself just read it in one night or one day. Oh, wow. Uh, basically. And just said, yeah, I was... I guess the book, and uh, that's, that, that was his comment. So I don't think it was really good. Yeah, I've heard many bad things about Artemis, uh, specifically that it's a female character, and the uh, way it's described and put is very unrealistic, and it's like a fantasy description of women. I mean, the the, the author supposedly tries to like write a teenage girl. As no, a main shit. character, and no, it's just that... or not either. I think she's like twenty years old, but close enough. And it's just su- su- supposedly the little I read about it. He writes her like sometimes she fantasizes about other characters that she doesn't even like, but just sexually fantasizes about them. <laughs> The the story is about um, a young girl committing the perfect crime on on moon, I think. So it's a high story or something like that, or just it's about smuggling and like going to the moon and stealing and conspiracies. I I don't don't really know, but it's it's kind of a different take. Yeah, that that sounds like a heist. Yeah, Yeah, probably. So we were talking about this with Adam, how some writers try to describe women, and he, sh- he showed me a thing you found. I randomly stumbled upon this while reading about how bad Artemis is, and how the <laughs> author can't write women. Now, this is not an excerpt from uh, this book, from Artemis, it's just, I-, I don't know where this comes from, I have no idea. But it's hilarious. Completely irrelevant, but I'm gonna read it to you. So this is <clears> an example how white writers describe women, or write about women. <clears throat> Cassandra woke up to the rays of the sun streaming through the slats on her blinds, cascading over her naked chest. She stretched, her breasts lifting with her arms as she greeted the sun. She rolled out of bed and put on a shirt, her nipples prominently showing through the thin fabric. She breasted boobily to the stairs and titted downwards. The end. (laughs) What the fuck? I honestly hope this is intentional satire and not uh, serious. It to <laughs> yeah. I, I, I feel Take like down. Up, up to the last sentence, I'm not, I don't think I read this, but I've definitely seen it in like 10 different movies, this exact yeah. thing. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, well, some of my, like two people told me, and then Adam uh, about this, I don't, Adam hasn't read it, but two people who read it told me that it's like, yeah, I was so disappointed. And uh, the character was like, Meh. So, I don't know. Guy who has an engineering degree trying to write women, that doesn't, that cannot end well, I think. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> cannot end well. <laughs> so, before he wrote Artemis, he was actually working on something called Zek. Z-H-E-K. And he said he's going to do his best to write a more traditional sci-fi story about aliens, so... Uh, fast than light travel, telepathy, like intergalactic relationships and something like that. And he's been writing this for I don't know how many years and then he officially gave up and he said, I've ri- read what I've written and it's so bad and I can't finish it and make it make sense and I can't make myself publish a book that I wouldn't enjoy to read myself. And he just like dismissed it and never published it. That's having standard. Yeah, that's good. So that brings us to the book we read and that's... Uh, the Project Hail Mary, which came out in 2021, and I didn't know anything. I know Adam liked it much better than the free body problem. <laughs> and, yes. Oh, yeah. and, and, he, and he kept messaging me, and I was like, excuse me, do you know what the book should be like? Do you know how they should describe the science? Read this book, excuse me, thank you very much. <laughs> Not like the free body problem. I always think about uh, the engineering like programmer joke. How the wife asked the husband to go shopping for eggs and milk. Do you know the joke? Yeah, I don't. So the wife says, uh, can I ask you a favor, darling? Can you go to the shop and buy a pint of milk? And if they have eggs, get a dozen. And he goes to the shop and comes back. And he returns with 12 pints of milk. 
And the wife is like, what the fuck? Are you an ah, idiot? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you buy 12 pints of milk? And the husband says, eh, they had eggs, so I got 12 pints of milk. Which, uh, if you find this funny, I think you love this book. But I don't think people <laughs> like this jokes. I, I think people think this is funny. <laughs> <laughs> Why it's good? <laughs> because it's 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 targeted on us. I think we are like we cannot be more target audience. <laughs> yeah, book. we are a bit of a focus group here. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And I think that's why the reviews are so high. Like this book is rated so high, and people are like raving about it. And people are this is so oh my god. But I think people who wouldn't like it, they don't even start or attempt because they already know what this is. Which is nice because it clearly advertises what the book is, I guess. Like it's technical sci-fi. In, in a sense, but I, I did read some negative reviews. And hmm. the, the one thing people have really hard time getting over is the main character. Oh. In my opinion, he's very similar. I mean, I mean, just like Martian, supposedly the main character is based on the writer himself. Makes sense. Uh, so his sense of humor is very similar. Um, the, the, the jokes, uh, not really work for some people in general, or the character and possibly the very lighthearted tone. Some people don't like it. I didn't have a problem with either. Me either. Yeah. I wasn't really laughing at anything. Like, I don't think it's funny. Like the humor, even in the Martian, like I'm going to science the shit out of this. Like, when yeah. I saw this in the trailer, I was like, oh God, I don't... <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I, I don't, I don't mind it. Like there are some puns in the book, and they like they like make fun of fun of sex or something. And I was like, mm-hmm, okay. It's like, <laughs> I, I think I it sets the 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 atmosphere. It's very, in a sense, despite what what's going on in the book, That's it's true. kind of lighthearted, which I think also makes it easy to read because it's not really depressing. In yeah, even though there are many the bad moments. And very serious, life-threatening moments. It's never feel serious. You're more like, oh, how is yeah. he going to solve this? <laughs> so that's that's very true. That might be why it's so easy to reach. Which I messaged Adam when I was starting starting with this book, and I was like, this is so fast. Like I've never read the book this quickly. It's so simple to read. Somehow it's so easy to understand and follow. Yep. I have one more engineer joke. An engineer finds a frog, and the frog says, If you kiss me, I'm gonna be a beautiful princess. I'll marry you. And the engineer picks up the frog and puts it in its pocket. And the frog's like, Why did you just kiss me? I'm, I have, like, big breasts, and I'm gonna be your best wife, and you're gonna live happily after. And the engineer's like, I don't care. Just, just, you know, you, you're a speaking frog. That's amazing. I'm going to the lab. I'm going to use... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So if you like these channel jokes, please read this book. <laughs> I suppose so, yeah. Yeah, so before we move on to the spoilers, as usual, we I think we don't have to say we all recommend this wholeheartedly. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, definitely. Yes. I would say if you're at least curious, definitely try to read it without any uh, looking up anything because I, I didn't know anything and I was super excited what's happening and I was uh, going into it with a little bit of a skeptical outlook and I wanted certain things from the book and they were very much there and I didn't expect that at all so <laughs> so I'm going to say before we move to spoilers <laughs> I think I got really what I expected I, I expected uh, an NDV or Martian like book mm. with a concise scientific story and that's exactly what I got I'm really happy about it I would definitely recommend it I think compared to the Martian story he threaded new ground and he tried something new like, I was expecting it to be super similar to The Martian, like, just a different setting. But there was, like, an element that I didn't expect, and I was very happy for. <laughs> That's true. That's true. And I think I know which part you're well, referring obviously. to. <laughs> but, but, yeah. I, 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 I agree. The, the, the same, pretty much. I, I didn't know anything about this book. I just read The Martian and expected not necessarily more of the same. I expected the same writing style. Mm-hmm. In a sense, it was a lot more, uh, more of the same than I was expecting. But in other ways, it was very different. So please don't expect anything and read it. I was like, oh my God, this is exactly what I wanted. <laughs> so long. <laughs> Nobody wrote about this. Okay, so if you don't have anything to say, I guess we can move on. We can press Boo Billy forward. 
So if you're reading this, please hit stop, don't listen, and come back after you've read it. If you absolutely don't care and don't want to read this, we'll do our best in the first like minute to like persuade you to still read it. So the element uh, we were talking about is aliens, of course. I didn't think there would be aliens. Aliens. <laughs> just... <laughs> I just imagined the meme, you know, the guy yes, with like yes. from yeah. the Discovery Channel. Aliens. Or aliens. <laughs> <laughs> that that's what summarizes this book completely, I think. I was reading this and at one point the alien in the book defecates from its face. And I read that and I was like, ah, that's the shit. Oh my god. That's what I wanted my whole life. <laughs> How did you like the alien face defecation scene? Uh, that was uh Oh, <laughs> it's unexpected. <laughs> yes, thank you. Yeah, I, I, I was lost for words. Yeah, just... <laughs> I was like, thank you. Which, which story described an alien defecating never happened in science fiction history? Please correct me at mindduckbooks at gmail.com. <laughs> Do you know of a story where an alien defecates? Send me an email. No, no, I, I don't think so, no. <laughs> yeah, it's a really hard one. Yeah, I would love yeah. to read those mails. So I'm going to ask this at the end, but uh, before we like spoil this, uh, maybe that still might make people read this. I think this might be my favorite alien in fiction of all time, maybe. I, I have to think about it. I, obviously, I'm biased because I just read it, but I was trying to think of other aliens that I liked a lot. And this might be like the thing I wanted from... A story of interacting with an alien. I think this is my favorite. My favorite. This is certainly one of the most characterized aliens I've ever seen. Most of the time, they are not. They don't really have a character. They are there to be an alien. Yeah. To do, do alien things. Uh, here, <laughs> alien he things. is a proper, pretty much main character, um, which is nice. Mm. That's, that's literally what I wanted all my life. I mean, you could argue that the Xenomorph is a main character in its own movie, mm. but he's not exactly characterized. I mean, otherwise, most of the aliens that get... A, I think more than in movies, possibly than books, I'm not sure. I, don't, I haven't actually read that much sci-fi that features aliens. The, the video games tend to have more aliens that actually have a character. But mm, that's true. most of the time they are very humanoid aliens. Mm -hmm. I was thinking something like Mass Effect, where yeah. pretty much all the major races are humanoid. Bipedal, yeah, the, the, the skeleton scratch is a bit, bit different, but more or less humanoid. It looks a bit different. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so like every sci-fi well games have it a little bit better but also like the the older sci-fi series have this problem with with aliens it's just mm -hmm. basically a man with different skin color and hair color, hair color and mm. maybe some like appendages added to it but <laughs> you know it's a it's still a human it kind of acts like a human it it speaks like a human it speaks english for some reason and yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so this this was really i didn't give it that much thought if i like this alien the most in any any like compared to any fiction because i think i'm too much of a stargate fan to say that i like don't love aliens from stargate but in in a in a way of character and how deeply we kind of explore the race itself, mm -hmm. uh, it's it's definitely hard to come by in sci-fi. Yeah, it's got a few points I desperately want in stories I like, and they are never there. The alien is intelligent, and there is realistic struggle with the communication, which never happens. And then it's got its own reasons for doing certain things their own way because obviously they think differently and they never depict aliens to think at all and when they finally are depicted to think then they think like people exactly the same i think one unique thing about uh, this alien actually is that in fiction usually when humans meet aliens aliens are much more technologically advanced also yes 
Hmm. Here, sure. uh, we are at best on the sort of same level. Hmm. To me, it seems like the, uh, what are they called? Uh, uh, the Eridians. Uh, Eridians uh, brute forced their way into yep. space travel with one OP material. Yep. And that's about it. Uh, otherwise, they are like a, maybe tens of years behind Earth technology. Exactly. They are super advanced and much more advanced than materials. And then also not as advanced in other things. So, of course, the answer yeah. wouldn't be as simple. So it, that's also interesting. It, it couldn't be written off. But they have this amazing technology that automatically translates our language. Yeah, it, that's, I was so happy that out. wasn't there. That, that's... Because we, we don't have the technology. So... Yeah, there's, there's like a little fish in your, in your ear. And yeah, now you understand exactly. everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is one way to explain it, but... Uh... Yeah, and the, the last point, the most, the biggest point I, I've never been satisfied with, make the alien the main character. Like, why is this not a thing? Finally, he is a character that's there the whole time and he's like the main character, as important as the other main character. Why is this not a thing? <sighs> Thank you. Finally. Yeah, I think it's it's just hard to imagine. All the, basically, you have to think about and understand a whole new culture, which did or did not evolve under similar circumstances as humans. So mm. I think it just has too many open ends that it can go into. Mm. So that many authors just, I don't know, like give up. I think it'd be very difficult because uh, you want to tell a story, but you don't want to like drown the story in the lore of the oh, species okay, that, that you sense. are like presenting. Yeah, that makes sense. Here it was uh, discovered by the main character. Uh, the, the main character was discovering these things mm. as he went along, which was a really good way to do it. But in a sense, the alien, I mean, he was the main a main character but he was secondary to our human main character still hmm. i was so happy that like a third of the book is just them trying to communicate it's like my <laughs> alien wet dream i i, I wanted it so much <laughs> I, I really enjoyed this section that was, that was amazing i was glued to the yeah, book at this point exactly yeah. that was my like thank you in the year i wanted this i never thought i would get this like we sort of get this in the arrival movie like it's about language and communicating to aliens have you seen Arrival? Oh, uh, no. I, I know you liked it, but I haven't seen it. I have not, yeah. Like, it's okay. Like, uh, like it's a sci-fi movie that's okay. And it sucks because for me it's okay. And for people who don't care, they hate it because it's too complicated and slow. That's about what I'm gonna say. It's like, you know, aliens, conflict, like, communication, whatever, but not fighting. To not spoil anything. They just try to do it without fighting and learn to communicate. And, okay, I was like, yes! Finally, this concept is being explored which is but it's like a few minutes in the movie so obviously there isn't any depth and this is like so much of this book is step by step discovering how to communicate and what kind of obstacles you would come by and there were many things that i i hate to admit i think about often how it would work or wouldn't if you communicated with somebody who doesn't you know who's an alien and at this in this book there were so many elements that made me so happy that, okay, somebody finally actually examined what would actually happen and how it would actually happen. So that was so nice. Definitely the best part of the book for me. So I'm afraid, like, in a in a movie kind of way, it just would be too boring. So do you think it, it's when there is going to be movie? How long, how long do you think there is going to be, like, all allocated to... You know, finding out about the language because I think it's gonna be just like yeah, five minutes. Just uh, obviously, yeah, yeah. yes. I'm giving like so, ten. Yeah. Obviously, so. the favorite part of the book is going to be skipped when they make a movie. Like in June, my favorite part of the whole book is when they sit and have dinner and talk about it, and that wasn't in the movie at all. Yeah. So this is gonna be skipped again. <laughs> but yeah, you're right. It, it's boring in a movie, I guess. No, it's just yeah, some things just don't translate into movie scene that well, mm. I guess. So in in a book way, this is absolutely amazing. In a movie, I think it would be really boring to just watch uh, them uh, like for, let's say, half an hour uh, just to try to figure out how to speak. Uh, it would get really repetitive very yeah, soon. If they're clever about it and they have breaks in between the moments that explain the language and like have it once in a while, 
I think it could be fun. But there must be m more explosions, you know? You know, there must be more <sighs> and drama and... <laughs> I can't imagine how they are going to turn this book into a movie. Not much happens for half of the book. It's this sort of stuff, it's the discovery and the science and not in as interesting way as it was in The Martian, where we at least mm. had the Mars and the, the environment was the enemy. Here you have the spaceship being like the enemy, I guess, like the, the problems on the spaceship and other environments being like, I, there are so many dramatic moments in this book. I think it's gonna be like, they're gonna pick and choose a few scenes that are definitely not gonna do all the problems because it'll be insane. It'll be like a seven season TV show. That would be awesome though. <laughs> Nobody would watch that. Like, I'm no, sure. No, why? <laughs> well, we would love it, but finally, it would be a sci-fi that's worth watching. People would be like, oh, "Fuck, fuck this show! I'm not a science lesson. I'm not watching this." But anyways, uh, if you like interspecies relationships, that sounds so bad. <laughs> <laughs> face defecation <laughs> facial defecation and interracial sex if you like that read this book obviously uh, if you are at least intrigued we still haven't said anything like we haven't really spoiled it I, like you don't get the thrill of like not expecting there would actually be alien contact but other than that uh, if any of this piqued your interest that's, that's even not the only alien in the book <laughs> oh that's true <laughs> well, well that would be very disappointing if this is like what you go in with and then you're like oh okay so the second alien is this nonsense but okay <laughs> okay alien life it's not the alien life so i guess we can finish up the uh, you know spoiler slide section uh, spoilers yeah the marketing material mentioned that they are aliens in this book yeah no, that's a good I question so. were these uh, even spoilers well there is a it's like a red herring right because there are aliens that are basically yeah, from the start thought, of exactly. the book and that's that's like uh, you expect those aliens to be there for the whole time and nothing exactly. more and that's then they exactly throw, what I throw like another alien at you and just okay <laughs> that's good <laughs> i like that that's just different <laughs> Let's get into the like super spoilers. If you're reading this, just don't read, don't listen. I, I think it's worth it. At least try it. And we get two timelines. One is on Earth, and the other one is on a spaceship. So the Earth timeline is about uh, an alien life that is consuming the energy of the sun, and it's causing a very slow apocalypse. Yeah. Yeah, basically the Earth is slowly freezing because the sun is being dimmer and dimmer, and this this like space bacteria or space amoeba or space one single single cell Al algae i think is the best way to describe it it's basically algae in the ocean so they have a discovery that there is a line of light from the sun to venus and there are these one cell organisms that get energy from the sun and then travel to venus which is rich in uh, carbon dioxide and that's where they reproduce and they have they are just more and more and more and they're eating the sun faster and faster which will decrease the temperature on earth and cause a lot of problems eventually extinction of everything so of course people have to do something about that so the whole book is about constructing a spaceship called the Hail Mary and sending it to a faraway star system 12 light years away where they discovered that the star there hasn't been affected while all other stars that we can see are dimming basically in, in the region yeah and this one is kind of in the center and is the only one not affected so we travel to this one so that's the premise so first uh, like fifth maybe of the book like not a very long part is uh, them studying they start to call it astrophage which is the space algae or plankton or whatever it is yeah it's it literally like translates into star eater which is which is awesome <laughs> from and, greek <laughs> yeah uh, and i think that like uh, the, the main character names it right or yes. was it yeah so the main character is uh, called ryland grace and he's a high school teacher and molecular biologist and uh, he loves science so the whole book he's super excited about you know he's motivated to save the children and uh, <laughs> save humanity and i don't think he cares about humanity that much he just cares about his children basically <laughs> Which by his children, he, he doesn't even have children, it's the student. Yeah. yeah. Which is one of the things I, I, I kind of didn't like, and that was that his family is not mentioned ever. I don't think Does he, he even have a, a family. family. I, I thought he lived alone. I'm not sure about his parents, but... Yeah, so they could have mentioned the parents at least. Uh, I don't know, it was strange. Like It was like a character outside of the world almost, because nobody was connected to him. It was kind of strange. 
Like, okay, he's a teacher, okay, he's important, but there is no relationship with anybody to him. I, I guess, in a sense. Which is kind of unrealistic in sense of this being super realistic, because obviously, even if he's a shut-in, like, lonely engineer, not talking to people ever, he would still have some relationships, which would somehow affect him being alone in space, which wasn't an element at all in this book, ever. Like, him being depressed because he's alone. Like, he, he mentions it a little bit, and then, okay, <laughs> I don't care, let's do science. So that's this, this part of the story, like, mental problems in space are not part of this at all. Wasn't that the same case in Martian, by the way? I don't know. I think he had a family in Martian, though. I think he had a daughter. Really? And a wife, and there was... Um, I, I, I'm kind of uh, guessing here, but I think I sort of remember that there was even a video call, or he made a video for them. I, I think he had a family. Here, I don't think they are ever mentioned. Huh. I don't know. Like, I don't remember from the movie just really him interacting with anyone except the uh, base control or uh, how, how yeah, they yeah, go. Yeah, it's not Houston. <laughs> Mission but... control, I guess. <laughs> no, anyway, it's not really relevant for this story and it's not why this story was written, but it, it's kind. Of, I was kind of like expecting something to come up. Well, it gives, it gives more space for the more cool stuff. I don't know. Like there's, there's relationships in every book, you know, this is nice change for, for once, I think. I think this is so hard, like targeting on like us, Like, you know, we love simply working, problem solving to 100% being solved and fuck the relationships. Like, we don't care about emotions. I, mean, I like, didn't let's... even notice there were no ah, relationships. I, I like, I love emotions, <laughs> but it just doesn't, you know. <laughs> Wait, okay, Adam. Okay. Emotions are cumbersome and we love not to have them. That's, that's, that's our lives. Like, we are giant nerds here. So this is like, you, you know, you have to admit that all three of us, if we really get into something, be it science, a game, or book, or something that we like to learn, and we are alone and being fully immersed in this, it's like the best feeling. And Yeah. yeah. But that's not most people. <laughs> fair, fair. So I feel like people like us, they just love this. And other people are like... These <coughs> I think many people have this exactly what you said, like from relationships. Because some people just getting to this flow through other people. But oh, okay. yeah, this way we are getting into like, yeah, kind of a flow state. And uh, this book just is, it, it has a lot of flow material. Mm -hmm. It combined all the stuff, like the fun, the adventure, the exploration, the aliens. And then you get this flow state and you learn something and you have the science. It's like hitting everything you want. Yeah. But, but for us, so I'm just trying to like... <laughs> repeat that you might not like this unless you've written a few applications before i guess <laughs> I, i don't think the, the programming part is necessary but yeah yeah but anyway so they uh, research this astrophage and uh, they find that uh, it's based on life based on water which is like a plot element i mean it's minor element where the where grace our main character previously When he worked as a scientist, uh, wrote a thesis that alien life uh, would probably not be based, uh, or not be water-based, likely use some other substances. And this is why he's basically called in to do the initial research on astrophage. Mm -hmm. And he yeah. discovers that it's based on water and is really <laughs> bummed about it. It's like, damn it! <laughs> And then he finds more alien life and more alien life. Like, everything's based on the same shit. And he's like, damn it! <laughs> That's kind of one of the jokes that I liked, but it yeah. wasn't really a joke. So they discover a very significant, amazing thing that the astrophage can absorb so much energy. So it can be used as fuel. I, I, I wanted to explain it more, but I guess there's no point. And that's pretty much it. It absorbs a lot of its great store of energy and they later figure out that they could use it as ideal fuel for this mission because Earth doesn't really have the technology to travel 12 light years away. But with Astrophage, it's I'm not going to say easy, but a lot more doable. So it becomes saving grace for humankind along with the yeah. main character. Oh, oh okay. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. 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 <laughs> so, this is the humor you get in this book. <laughs> At one point, the scientists are having sex and one of the people are like okay let's have a 15 minute like sex break and the other one says let's engage in sexual congress and i was like what is this is this what 
scientists get off at? Like, are they like pretending to to speak in broken English and and then hey, they have sex? Is that what scientists like? We, we, we didn't just jump two thirds of the book, but I <laughs> hated this section. It was so out of place. Yeah, I was actually like really this like confused. <laughs> what, what was the point? Of, what was the what, point? What was of the this? point? Why is this here? I don't it's, understand. It's humor. Like, That's what I yeah. I, Just I mean, even even the two characters that uh, like uh, initiate all this, they're, they're irrelevant. Exactly. exactly. I, I exactly. get the, They are I, there to die off. I get the gist <laughs> because there's a you know they he needed a way for them to be together. So that's one thing. Um, oh, but okay. He needed. He needed a way to, I guess, portray that, you know, it's the fucking apocalypse. Like, nothing ah, really yes. matters, so let's just fuck, you know? So uh, that that was, I think, just an idea he wanted to explore. But It was, it was kind of funny, but not really. Uh, yeah. That's why I brought it up. The humor is kind of, like, amusing and kind of bad. Like, it's like... What? Like all the jokes are like what? Like one of the scientists at one point they they're like we we've done a laser experiment. It was very illuminating. And the guy even says, "It was a Russian pun." And he was like, "Yes, Russian <laughs> pun." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was like, what the fuck? "It's like very you know scientific dad jokes and a lot of them." <laughs> so th- so th- this is what's going on in his head when he's smiling in his, his cheeks and he's looking like he's going to kill us. He's thinking of his these puns. <laughs> And he's like, these fuckers wouldn't understand my puns. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he's thinking about. <laughs> yeah, so they find out that the astrophage can have so much energy stored into it, they can use it for so many things. There are a few accidents that happen. Uh, things explode because so much energy is stored into it. And uh, I'm, I'm trying to just not to like, over explain everything. But I, I mean, basically, we need to build a ship. I, I mean, we are skipping kind of forward here. Uh, at first, the, the we, we should talk about uh, Eva Strat. Kind of skip that. So there is this character, pretty much the only other big character in the book, who is person who's tasked with saving the Earth, basically. Uh, mm-hmm. She's given authority to do just about anything, and for some reason, everyone goes along with it. For well, some reason, they they uh, elect her or decide that she's gonna have unlimited authority. I mean, yes. Yeah, it's it's explained in a way that you know. There's... Dare I say, this is the thing that was hardest to believe in the entire book. <laughs> yeah, it was. I guess it. Uh, yeah, humans be humans. That's true. But yes, you know, you know. When facing some grand problem that basically just spells doom for the whole earth, I, 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 I don't, want, I don't want to get too political. But here is this: there are these two things: global warming and coronavirus. <laughs> yes, this is exactly why but, we love this book because it's like a sweet fantasy Star Trek like yeah, yeah, exactly. future. That's why this is yeah, so yeah. nice because we want this to be true, but we know it couldn't be. But it was in this book. I was like, yes, thank you, this person. <sighs> oh definitely, my God. definitely. I don't know. It was I very nice be, to yeah. see. It wasn't frustra- frustrating in this way. I might might have to like uh, yeah optimistic view on humanity, but I think <laughs> if we would be faced with really like grave danger, which is obvious, like global warming, yeah, but mm. it's just nothing that kind of spells doom uh, in the whole. I, I, I can already scale. see the reactions. When I look at the sun, my eyes still hurt, so it's not dimming. Yeah. Ah, God damn it. I have no like, faith in humanity. <laughs> this is also super slow. Like they said, it would take. 20 or 30 years to have the apocalypse happen so people would be just like okay yeah it's gonna maybe but i don't care it would definitely not be as easy as appointing a person to do anything in humanity's power to solve this problem and it would definitely not go as easily but it's so nice that it does in this book because that's what we want very nice fantasy Yes. yes But but to be fair, like I wouldn't want to disagree with this woman she has really good authority by herself uh, so she's in the right place. Yeah. So so she she directs everything. She picks out the astronauts. She like decides what what will be researched. Yeah. She just basically pushes the research forward and makes sure that nobody like stalls it. Like if there are some political, bureaucratic, nonsensical procedures, she's like, no, fuck it. You have to move on. Go go go. And this is what it's gonna do. We have to be using proven technology. Just just make it. Do it. Go. We have to send a ship tomorrow, basically. So she's the person you 
need and want, but let's hope. Let's be positive like Martin. Let's hope that it would happen. I would love that to happen. It's it's a it's a, a very naive way of thinking, but I'm standing by it. I I imagine that if there were a problem that says that you know in 40 years there's not going to be Earth to live on, mm. I think it would be possible to. Okay, have, it's a very big yeah. Yeah, have Earth you know kind of unite. Which like be it realistic or not, either way, this is what I'm missing in fiction recently so much that's why i like this so much because star trek was the positive future depiction and actually inspired some people to do something and nowadays sci-fi is just abysmal just grim death and anti-utopia dystopia just everybody dying depression alien fighting lasers explosions like like why can't we have nice things like just something <laughs> You know, t- t- I, I was missing this so much. Like, like even the free body problem. Like, like people are doing things, but they are so depressed about it. Like they are making things happen and accomplishing things, and you know. But it's so depressing. I, I just miss sci-fi that's positive so much. So yeah, <laughs> Eva Strat is a bastard, and she just organizes everything. Yes. <laughs> well. What we are skipping is just discovery, science problem, something happened, uh, a scientist had sex and laughed about it. It's like details, 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 details. Yeah. So I'm gonna try to like move over the other part of the plot, which is the majority of the book. And then I'd like to just like pick and choose some things that you really liked or you wanted to talk about, because there's really no point to describe like step by step, because we would be here forever. Yeah, <laughs> but the thing that made us excited was that he gets on the spaceship. So there's a crew, and uh, they are sent on this Hail Mary spaceship. It's also a plot element that they have to be in a coma so they wouldn't go crazy. There are all kinds of details connected to that. Let's not over-explain that. We can come back to it with the ending. But uh, he, so, so there is three people on the spaceship. But unfortunately, just one person, our main character, survives, and he arrives to this other star system, and his mission is to find out why this star in Tau Ceti has not been affected by astrophage and he needs to study it and send back information to Earth so they can save Earth. But immediately somebody knocks on his spaceship and he's like, oh, what is this? And then there's a daily spaceship. I was like, oh, it's a daily spaceship. And I was sure that they would be just, you know, sending some codes and they would be like solving the puzzle or something and they would never meet. And then immediately they want to meet. And I was like, oh my God, they're meeting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was so awesome. <laughs> like part of the book. <laughs> just, yeah. just all the expectations, just throwing them out of the window exactly <laughs> <You know? laughs> i was sure none of this would happen it never happens in the stories as i want to and they, here somehow it all happened how i wanted it to happen i was yeah. like please meet immediately i was like yes let's meet now and then i was like please show the alien immediately i said yes we know what he looks like and then please just try to talk and they were like okay let's try to talk for the next 27,000 days <laughs> <laughs> yeah We have time, so, right? It's not like our yeah. suns are blowing up or it's slowly dying. So as you might expect, the plot eventually comes around and the this guy, our main character, along with one alien, Eridian, work together to solve this problem, which is like the later part of the book. But the main part of the book, I would think, is them meeting for the first time. The other alien spaceship slowly comes near the... I mean to say Czech alien spaceship. The, the human alien spaceship. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Czech spaceship. <laughs> <laughs> We were there first, Tau Ceti. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> like the the TV show about the Czech astronauts recently, I forgot what it's called. The, the like they sent Slovakian spaceships and Czech spaceships to What? I haven't heard about that. What's the It's like a that? very very strange funny Czech uh, TV show about space exploration. It's really good and really bad at the same time. It's called Cosmos with a K from 2016. Uh, the spaceship, so he sees it on the radar and the first interaction is they throw an object very slowly so he can catch it and in the object there's a model and the model shows like him and the spaceship and then they sh- send another model and it's just, I, I don't know, I don't have to talk about this, it's so many ba- details. They basically find out a way to communicate even though they have nothing in common basically. Hmm. And the only thing in common they have is 
I don't know, like gestures, I guess, and you mm-hmm. know, sense of uh, sense of. Uh, well, they later discover that they don't really use the same senses to perceive the world, but their sense of objects is kind of similar. So that's what they start with, and then mm. they build on that, and the process of building on this. Uh, it's really mm-hmm. nice. It's a lot of yeah. trial and error. That's what I love. Sometimes yeah. they arrive at a, a solution kind of by accident, like mm. uh, with the transparent Xenonite. Yeah, I love that so um, much. Like the accidental the, the, discovery. That's really nice. The where, where the alien shows him a bunch of different hexagons and he looks through the transparent one because that's the only one he can look through. So the alien decides that he's going to make stuff from this. Hmm. And so now he can see through the, the wall that he builds there. Mm-hmm. That was really nice. And we discover that the alien cannot see, but they use echolocation to see, which we don't find out until much later. And it's very funny how they find out and what that entails and how many yeah. mistakes they made because of that. And it's it's kind of endearing how they learn all this. And there's no point in explaining all the steps. I would just be yeah, like... Ba- basically, yeah. a large part of the, the space part of the book is uh, learning about the aliens and learning the language. And then the second part of this is actually solving the problem on Earth. Mm-hmm. Or not on Earth, in Tau Ceti. Like, yeah. It's a very scientific way to look at encounter with aliens. Uh, because mm-hmm. this is how you problem solve things in science. You just don't exactly. know anything about the thing and you slowly, by trial and error, just find out more things about it. And the more you know, the easier it gets to yeah. find more complex things about the problem. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I think even though the two parts were different, like uh, finding out how to solve the problem with Earth dying and Eridani dying and mm-hmm. the problem with communicating with Rocky, the alien, it's actually quite similar concept, right? Mm-hmm. It's just applied in a different way on a different thing. And the science part I of think it. I might just... like this so much because the tedious exposition dump that usually happens doesn't happen and it's the point itself and it feels very natural and organic and like trial and error and like you go along the way to discover what he learns about everything and it doesn't feel like you're just being told things to know and be able to understand the story you're actually living through discovering how it works which is not very common in stories like in a typical sci-fi story it would be like okay so he found a hidden diary of somebody who studied oh, iridians yeah. and there is a so they get five legs and this is the pressure of the atmosphere and they they talk like whales okay and now let's move on with the story but here they actually spend the time to experience it which never happens yeah, so to answer some questions for people who gave up on reading and just want to know what this was about so uh, they connect these two spaceships and he gets in there they construct like a like a wall in a tunnel so he can see through and they start to learn to communicate and when he first sees him he sees like a dog-sized five arm or five leg creature that's like kind of made of stone and it's got like all these tentacles that are kind of tentacles but they have like a joint in them or something and all of them have three fingers like a, a claw basically and the, i like i was so happy about the first reaction because i thought that he was immediately going to like study him or like um, take pictures or something. I was like, oh fuck, giant spider, run away. (laughs) (laughs) That was very, that's not very real. Yeah, that's very, very (laughs) human-like, I think. (laughs) So I I appreciate these moments. They felt very genuine. Like uh, they didn't feel dumb at any time. There's a point at this moment that I wanted to mention because I was like for fun for the fun of it trying to like nitpick the book that cannot be nitpicked and I think one of the problems that I could find was that he is being very unreasonable with the first contact because he gets this like package and he opens it immediately uh, okay but why wouldn't he open it in the airlock while he has the suit on why wouldn't he open it with some tools why wouldn't so he burns his hands a little bit and he just like just smells it with yeah. his face immediately he's like, a scientist what? he doesn't care about those things that's 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 for other people to think about he's a but, scientist you but know, that's he, exactly he why he should out. care because he knows what could happen like he could get uh, you know? like do you remember the parts when we had when he was discovering about the astrophages he did similar things he just you know didn't think about okay all but the he's not in space possibilities and he's not uh, true but he's still him I don't know, like, even though he's in space, he's still, like, you don't just, you know, change your character because you're in a different environment. I guess slightly yes, but 
It's just his nature. I don't think he's that it careful of a person. very reckless. I, I'm not sure I would say it's completely out of character, but it, I, I do agree it's a bit far-fetched. He'd be this careless. He wasn't this careless in the lap on Earth. Like, the, just the first, very first things that he tried to, like, open and touch and contact, he didn't take any precautions about any of this. I was expecting them to do, like, a lot of just precautions, but never mind. And another thing was that when he started spinning the ship to be able to examine the cylinder that he got, like, the object from the alien spaceship, he didn't even care where it was. He just, like, left it in the airlock or something. And then he started spinning the ship, and I was imagining this, like, precious object first communication with alien species, like, spinning around the airlock and banging on the walls. And he was like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and now I'm gonna pick it up. It's conveniently on the on the floor now, so I can get it. So why wouldn't he just be a little bit more careful? <laughs> but it doesn't matter. I I can see your point. Yeah, it was kind also, of. So first reckless. thing he did, like, why do people always do this? He took a hammer and banged it with a hammer. I was like, why the fuck do this? <laughs> <laughs> like every time like the free body problem <laughs> fucking spaceship comes from somewhere and like, okay let's bang it with hammers <laughs> like <laughs> why can't you do something else oh it's not important uh, and one last thing why didn't he immediately film everything on cameras like he he also acknowledges it in the books and he said no one would have the presence of mind to film it now when you're meeting an alien species for the first time. It, of course you would, that's the point, damn it. <laughs> Why would you not immediately film everything you're doing? To be fair, I, th I think like this is not a safety thing. This is just, you have to uh, yeah, realize, yeah, yeah, yeah. realize, I guess. You, you could be excited, too, too excited to forget. Hmm. At these, first, at least. These are the two like illogical things uh, that I could find like while reading the whole book. So. <laughs> just at this section of the book the one thing that i found one of the funny things kind of funny was when uh rocky the, the, the alien is called rocky i'm sure you mentioned it uh he's playing with the tape measure yeah i like that a lot oh, of yeah. <laughs> really, right? it was really funny <laughs> I, just, I just keeps playing with the tape measure and it's so good because he wouldn't expect that the uh, pressure of the other atmosphere would basically destroy it and it was so hot in the other atmosphere in the alien atmosphere that it was kind of demolished and the, yeah. he didn't know the alien couldn't see, so he couldn't see the numbers on the tape measure. So just like trying to do other uh, stuff with it. Yeah. And that was so clever to introduce the concept of why would you assume they can see? Yeah, a lot of these concepts are introduced really accidentally, mm. but that's the clever part. Like with the transparent xenonite, Rocky didn't know it's transparent. He didn't care. It's just the one that the, the human picked. Mm -hmm. So Rocky can see like surfaces, textures, and like the materials surface because he just sees like the sound bouncing off of them so that's why yeah and he's called rocky because his body is made out of like this surface like carapace that looks like stone he's got like vents on itself that like heats or cools down his body and they can never be in the same place because the atmosphere for iridians has to be 29 times more pressure than earth and also it's super hot and it's ammoniac and all this we have to mention sleeping oh yeah Sleeping is really interesting cultural note on Eridians. Because <laughs> if I can explain, Eridians for some reason or have evolved in a way that they watch over each other during their sleep. And their sleep schedules are not similar to humans. They are similar, but not really. They sleep much less often, but for much longer time. And Grace just finds that so freaking weird. I, I guess he has a point because he, Rocky just asks him out of the blue just to like watch him sleep and Grace was totally creeped out but <laughs> mm -hmm. what did you think about that? It's another of the things that uh, are explained almost by accident because like we arrive at the explanation a bit later it's because Eridians when they sleep they can't really be woken up they just sleep until they wake up after i don't know i think they said about 12 hours so because they can't wake up you can't wake them up they need someone to protect them while they are sleeping this is why they need someone to watch them hmm. i mean rocky doesn't really understand that humans don't need this that humans can kind of woke, wake up on their own so he expects to be watched sleeping and then he expects to watch uh, grace sleeping yeah you also forgot to say that i read it as text martin listened to it as an audiobook in the czech language in and czech, adam listened yeah. to it as an audiobook in english <laughs> and the uh, yeah. alien himself 
So we have we meet just one of them, and he uh, is described to be speaking as a uh, whale song or like whale sounds, like just just melody melody notes. And they work out the system on the PC, and they they work out their vocabulary system, and they they learn to communicate. Are they actually notes like musical notes in the book? Yes. Or yeah, they just have like uh, in, a in, picture. They don't yeah. say which notes. Yes. Ah, okay. Uh, in the audiobook, uh, in the English audiobook, it's uh, synth notes. I, I, I'm not. Mm. I'm not into music. I don't understand what synth notes are, but it sounded like electric tones, mm. basically. Yeah, it's the Artificial same. Artificial notes. Cool. It's the same in the Czech book. Uh, I'm Czech kind of curious. Book. I have to look this up. Maybe I'll put a clip here for the listeners. Yeah. Says Rocky's voice. And to Rocky, after he's being translated by the uh, by the computer. The speech, he sounds kind of robotic. It was really nice. I, I liked it mm-hmm. a lot. Yeah, so uh, we could talk about this forever. So I guess we should move on. We've already been talking too long. So we, we love this so much. And then they finally figure out all this uh, intergalactic species communication culture nonsense with many problems and mistakes. And then finally, they have enough knowledge to actually talk to each other about something complicated. So, so Grace is like, okay, so I know you're here because of this. Me too. So let's try to do something about it. And they find out that Rocky has already been there 40 years. And yeah. his whole crew that was 23 Leridians all died. Which is very sad. Yeah. And, and he doesn't know why. Then they find out that Rocky's race or civilization, they have never discovered radiation. And they wouldn't shield themselves from radiation. And he was working in the back of the ship near the engines where the astrophage uh, is stored, the, the fuel, and that shields him from radiation. And that's why he survived. Basically, it comes back to the thing that Eridians are not really very technically advanced, and at least in this field, they never traveled off their world. They only stayed in orbit where, where they were protected from radiation by uh, their uh, yeah, the Earth atmosphere. atmosphere. Not atmosphere, but whatever. It's about the magnetic atmosphere. field. Hmm. Basically. Yeah, magnetic field. So they, they didn't know about radiation at all as i said they brute forced their way to another solar (laughs) system it's amazing yeah they basically built this thing can and just sent it to the point from which the you know the sun was shining and uh, expected to arrive there i don't know actually didn't know even about yeah relativity so uh yes (laughs) that's what i meant to say much more of uh, like much longer trip than they did and the rocky was totally confused why it didn't take so long as it did mm. so the, like the space fairing it kind of makes sense because they just don't see they don't see in a way we do so they don't really receive electromagnetic radiation from space so lights from space so mm-hmm. exploring something beyond their atmosphere is where you know the the sound doesn't propagate that uh, just seems like yeah, it's utter darkness for them. So it's even... Yeah. I kind of have a question because I don't really know what, how they got to know that they have to travel to space. Like I what? think I think they said... Like there's a point in the book where uh, Rocky is like, oh, humans can see stars with their own eyes without any devices. And it's like, oh my God, amazing. And uh, then they talk about uh, that they have a device that transforms uh, wavelength, like visual oh, yeah, light, true. to like the had, surfaces. Some... So I, I think they had to make a device that just shows them the stars, but like a surface texture on a display, which basically is possible for them to see, but they they can't see it as easily, and it's it's tedious and long. So they could find the sun with technology, but then it's it takes time. And <laughs> how the hell? <laughs> Did they know that they were to look there? Because they technically... What did they know from astrophages like trying to consume their sun? Their planet was getting colder. That's it, I guess, right? And they wanted they didn't to dis- explain this in detail, yeah. Yeah, they wanted to discover like why our planet is becoming colder. How did they get to... Oh, there are like, you know, things beyond our atmosphere and there is mm. the sun that's being consumed by this oh, no, no, alien no, no, species. No. Uh, they, they were already in orbit. Oh, they yeah, had the technology they, to be in orbit. They had space elevator, so they know, right? Uh, they, uh, oh, yes. Uh, yeah, they had space <laughs> elevator. Like they had some technology. They just never left the orbit, but they could see like the stars, I presume. Okay, okay. That makes sense then. In a way. It's not 
really explored in depth why they never left orbit. That's one of the things that kind of bothered me. Hmm. Um, how, how advanced exactly they are, but yeah. I, I, I can imagine it would happen somehow with science and like, technology. To be frank, it would be just they, they c- come up to the space elevator and all they see is nothing yeah. around them. And how do they... Until they use well, a device to look. Uh, yeah, but but I guess, yeah, it's a scientific way to try to discover things you don't know. And if they know that there is space beyond the thing that they built, then I guess there is curiosity and curiosity drives the way to, you know, try to figure out mm. what's there. So I, I, okay, it's believable, I guess it's believable. So they finally learn to communicate and they get to this star that doesn't get dimmer and they have a hypothesis that there is a natural predator, like another one-celled organism, like an amoeba, that's a predator and they eat the astrophage. And that's how they limit the overpopulation of astrophage, which the hypothesis turns out to be true. Uh, but they can't like test it and they can't get the sample and they have this like super complicated way to get the sample and then everything almost explodes. There's so much stuff we could describe, <laughs> but I'm not sure yeah. you should talk about that in uh, so much uh, detail. In, in short, they need to retrieve the sample from certain depth of the atmosphere of the the, the planet that has carbon dioxide, I think. The other, yeah, carbon dioxide. But the the ship can't get that low, so they build a giant uh, chain to scoop some up, and they burn half of the ship doing it because the engines uh, yeah, burn the the fuel tanks, I think, or something like that. So they finally get the sample, and then they find out that yes, there are predators, but they can't survive in the atmosphere of Venus, where we have to plan them to limit the population of astrophage, nor at the other planet that Rocky in his Iridian system needs. So they devise another plan after a lot of science that they would breed and modify the amoeba that they started calling Tauiba, Taumiba, how did you pronounce that? Taumibs? Yeah, pretty much that. Taumibs, Taumiba. And uh, basically they just breed it and breed it and breed it and breed it and each, each generation they introduce a little bit of more, I think, nitrogen or something. Yeah. Uh, basically they try to make it resistant to the atmosphere of the other planet so we can survive there too and therefore they can use it as a predator at Venus and the other is I think it's called Free World, the planet. Yeah. So that all works yeah. out. And and mean, meanwhile also Taumibas invade the fuel tanks yes. of Hail Mary and eat half of their fuel. So that's that's the last like Yeah, that's the plot <laughs> twist of Taumibas not only evolved to survive in nitrogen. This happens twice. Yeah. Once it happens after they scoop the atmosphere and it happens again at the end. Ah. Yes. True, true. Okay, the first time it was because of uh, of the hole in the hull of the ship? Yes, because because the, the engines burned a hole in the fuel yeah, tanks. Yeah, okay. And that's how the Taumobibas got in. And the second time, it doesn't actually happen to Hail Mary. It only happens to... Because uh, Grace is able to stop it in time. Yeah. Hmm. But uh, he recognizes that uh, Rocky wouldn't be able to stop it because he can't see. Yeah, it's like a dramatic climax because... We didn't say that uh, this is a suicide mission, so Grace was uh, expected to find out about this predator or any way to stop Astrophage and then send small probes back to Earth and he would just be left there without enough fuel and die. But Rocky in his uh, Iridian spaceship had a lot of fuel, so he would pump fuel to his spaceship and and Grace was able to come home. Uh, And that's already after they have breeded this Taumiba. So they separate and they it's like this emotional goodbye with an alien and friend and we'll never see you again, goodbye, and they leave. At this point they spend several months together. Yeah. And then they find out that the Taumiba eats the fuel like the second time and Grace realizes that like Adam said Rocky would have the same problem and he doesn't have anything to do about it. So he's got like a dilemma. Do I survive, go home and le- leave Rocky to be or do I come back to help him? So of course he comes to save Rocky. And there's another dramatic scene and science experiment showdown <laughs> to help and save Rocky. And to be fair, at this point, uh, it's not like Earth won't be saved. Uh, Grace has uh, like uh, rockets that were designed to return the sample to Earth. Since it was a suicide mission, unlike the, uh, the, the aliens who are expected to come, uh, kind of expected to come back, I guess. Mm-hmm. So Earth is saved because he saved, he sent the 
Astrophage uh, Predator, ta umíba, to Earth. And he has time to come to Rocky to save him, but that means he won't be able to go to Earth because that's a completely different direction and not enough fuel and such. And all the fuel is eaten by Taumiba at Rocky's ship, so they have to use the fuel that he's got to go to the Eridian system so they can save Rocky's people or Rocky's spider people. I don't know what you call those. Eridian. Eridians. So there is a very uh, heartfelt, like emotional reunion with them after they separated. So he's like yeah. beeping, squealing. How was that in the audiobook? Uh, I mean, Ro- Rocky was just uh, really happy. I can't quite remember what he said, but yeah, he was ec- ecstatic. Yes. They changed the pitch of uh, the tune to express emotion, basically. They Oh yeah, a l- yeah, a little bit, yes. Well, at uh, at one point, I don't know if it was in the English audiobook, but uh, in the Czech audiobook, at one point, the beeping sounds basically didn't appear uh, at, uh, anymore because he just could understand Rocky. Oh yeah. So it was basically translated through Grace to English or to Czech, and hmm. it was only mentioned that the pitch was higher. Uh, through grace, but but the sounds were never uh, used. I actually, I actually think the English audiobook did raise the pitch on the like robotic voice of Rocky at that <laughs> okay. point, but only a little bit. Oh, really? Okay. I don't think that was in the Czech one. So there are two plot points to finish this up. One of them is like the ultimate plot twist uh, that Adam liked. I was really worried about how they are going to end the book. Like when they separated, it was like, okay, what's going to happen now? This is not really a conclusive ending. And there mm-hmm. is like an hour and a half left of the audiobook, maybe an hour. <laughs> what the heck is going to happen? <laughs> yeah. And I really... L- I mean, I didn't really like this twist with the Taumoiba escaping again. I thought that was kind of like, uh, again, really. Mm, I was expecting a, it to. A little, I was a little bit tired of the, here is a problem and here's a solution. And here is a problem and here is a solution. It gets a little bit old. It did get old in Martian as well. Mm. So I was like, I was not super on board with that, but... In the end, the way that they reunited and uh, went to the Eridian system and Grace basically settled there and the the ultimate cheesy plot twist where he ends up teaching a bunch of spider yeah. kids. Yeah. It was hilarious. <laughs> I, I love it. He has new children uh, now. <laughs> he saved the that, old that, children. That was, and then... that was fantastic. I really liked that. I, so I just, just to say so... for people who haven't read it, so he ends up at Eridian and they build a place for him and he is like cherished as an alien among Eridians and he has uh, conversations with Rocky who comes back to Adrian, his uh, spider wife, and he teaches spider children science in like a special place. Okay, continue. I mean, that's the, that's the end of the book uh, at that point, yeah. And he he figures out, or he's told that after like 16 years or something, that Earth uh, survived, that uh, our sun returned to normal. So presumably humans were able to recover the rockets and uh, save Earth. But at the point, it's not really worth it to go back to Earth because it takes 13, 16 years, I don't know how many, and he's already been away like 16 years and he's already taken that much time to travel somewhere. So he doesn't even know anybody who's alive anymore. And he doesn't want to risk going into and coma he's too again old anymore he's and he wouldn't survive the coma. He didn't this. mention that the coma killed two of his comrades that were supposed to fly with him. So he was already not sure about uh, whether to stay awake or go into the coma. Mm. And since now he's even older and given the time dilatation, it just doesn't make much sense to return to Earth at that point. The plot twist I wanted to mention that Adam liked was we didn't say that uh, the book is uh, narrated in a way that he is regaining his memories. And he doesn't know who he is when he wakes up and we are to believe that it's because he was in a coma. It's like that for everybody. But then we find out that he didn't want to go on the suicide mission and he was forced to go. And that's why they put an extra drug into this uh, coma machine. So he would forget that he didn't want to go. And when he slowly regained his memory, he would remember that he didn't want to go later. And that's too late for him to go back and give up on the mission. And... It worked yeah, as planned. If we go back to the to the two scientists that were always talking about sex, they get killed in an experiment. I think it was the main scientist and the backup. Yes. Mm-hmm. And now they don't have a backup. Uh, and the only suitable person is Grace. Yeah. But Grace doesn't want to go. Yeah. He doesn't want to go on a suicide mission. Like, at all. So they drag him and put him on the ship. 
<laughs> and they drag him in a way that he loses his memories so that he would like get invested in the mission as he regains his memories but at the point when he remembers that he was dragged and put on the suicide mission he will be too invested in the solving the issue that he won't mind anymore and that's exactly what happened i really like that the main character really didn't want to go on the suicide yeah, yeah. mission it's not like some heroic uh, hero basically yeah let, let, let's be clear here he may not be a hero but he is still like borderline superhuman super smart mm. person it, it's a power fantasy at core yeah, yeah, yeah. very similar to to the martian very different kind of power fantasy though yeah yeah very different kind of power fantasy which is interesting that's uh, definitely why definitely the appeal of this book So I guess we're about to finish. I just wanted to say, like I said, I still feel like Rocky might be my favorite alien in fiction. And uh, even though at the end of the book, he he's much more human-like than, than he probably should be. He like learns some human-like mannerisms and he kind of make a joke, makes a joke at the point and then he learns what sarcasm means. And, and they have like a super friendly chat at the end of the book where Rex is teaching spider children and Rocky's like, ha ha this is so funny, I'm going to go get my wife and watch her sleep and stuff. I liked it a lot, but I meant it was kind of borderline like too human at the time. I don't know. I felt like it was uh, just they spent a lot of time together. So Which, it, yes, it's, exactly. uh, it's fair to say that they're going to catch on some things from themselves. The yes. one thing that I would have a nitpick on is that Grace didn't catch any habits from Rocky. Yeah. Like, they were together a really long time. Why did Grace... Well, maybe the sleeping thing? Yeah, I yeah, think yeah. he got... Uh, he finally, like, at one point got used to mm, being watched and watching that, yes. Rocky. But otherwise, there was not really that much explored in this part. But Rocky actually took a lot from Grace. And maybe, as you said, it was kind of not really portrayed how he got so uh, so mm, human-like. It makes sense, like, as you said. But he would it, have learned stuff. Yeah, he, yeah and uh, bear in mind, he's a supercomputer, basically. So he learns much faster than humans do learn. I <laughs> okay. Think. Yeah, we never mentioned that that he can remember everything, and they don't even have computers in his uh, on his planet yeah. and stuff. It's like a super brain. He's really smart in such a way. He has a lot of capacity to learn from Grace mm -hmm. in his ways. So thank you so much, Martin, for joining us, even though it's not an easy time in your life now. <laughs> it's fine. It's, it's a nice distraction. Thank you, Philip, for inviting me. And thank you, Adam, for telling me to read this. I really, really liked it. I appreciate it. Glad you liked it. <laughs> uh, we might do another episode, like The Moon is the Harsh Mistress. I would love to read that sometime, or you'll see. One of the future episodes, one of Martin's uh, and Adam's all-time favorite uh, from the Stormlight Archive by Brandon Sanderson, uh, yes. The Way of Kings, yes. thousand plus book. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone needs to read that book. <laughs> Thanks a lot for listening. See you on the next episode. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you very much for listening this exciting episode of uh, our Mind Deck Books podcast. Please rate us on Apple Podcasts or any platform. And on the next episode, we're going to finally discuss the long-awaited Foundation by Isaac Asimov. Yas is going to join me as a guest. And uh, I don't want to spoil anything, but we didn't like this book as much as we expected to. <laughs>